Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this important hearing. Mr. Secretary, good morning. Thank you. Nice to see you. First of all, let me commend you for uh, taking diplomacy on the road, not just abroad, but here in America. It was great to see you in Iowa talking about the importance of diplomacy to America. I would have preferred that you had done that in Nebraska, but I close guess enough. I would Kansas. I owe you one. Okay. Yes. All right. It's the neighborhood, so, but again, great job. We really appreciated you coming out. Um, last summer, you convened a ministerial of foreign leaders to speak to the issue of religious pluralism and the respect for human dignity, the sacred space of conscience and the exercise of that right. Around the same time, at the behest of the Vice President, um, I traveled to northern Iraq along with Ambassador Sam Brownback as well as uh, Mark Green, USAID director to look at the dynamics of how our substantive aid that had been shifted to help the religious minority communities there who had been, have been so decimated by the genocide of ISIS, how that aid uh, could be sustained. I, walked, I came back from that experience with three words in my mind. It's possible, it's urgent, but it depends on security. Um, you and I have had this conversation before, but I'd like to take just a few moments to unpack it a little bit more publicly. In response to that last piece, the security piece, um, I am very shortly, perhaps even today, introducing in a Northern Iraq security resolution along with my good friend Anna Eshoo, Democrat from California. We've worked very closely with the Foreign Affairs Com Committee. I'm hopeful that the United States Congress rallies around this concept of simply laying down a marker that urges with the international community help the Iraqi central government and the Kurdish government to integrate Christians and Yazidis and other religious minorities, Islamic minorities, into the regularized security forces with some degree of authority to protect Nineveh and Sinjar. If we don't do this, all of this aid is not going to be sustainable. There are willing international partners. Uh, there is certain sensitivities, sensibilities to this all over the world, uh, among the Iraqis, among the Kurds, other international partners, with you, with the Vice President's office, with the administration. So I'd like your response to this concept, again, of the United States just laying down a marker saying this is an important long-term strategy to restore the ancient tapestry of religious pluralism that used to thrive, particularly in northern Iraq as well as Baghdad but has been so decimated. And without that, we're going to lose that rich tradition. There's going to be more pressure for out-migration. Can the Iraqis ever achieve peace without this fundamental concept of tolerance and the space for religious pluralism? Uh, you, you and I have had a chance to talk about this. I'm, I'm happy that you raised it here this morning. Um, I, the State Department and I can absolutely agree that this is a priority. I look forward to seeing the legislation. I haven't had a chance to see the legislation that you and Ms. Eshoo are are going to present. Uh, we're happy to work with you to to, uh, to see how we can effectuate that. Uh, our, our mission set has been pretty clear uh, to try and work with the uh, Iraqi government uh, to un understand, to help them understand how important this is to get to the resolution, the political resolution of a free, independent, sovereign Iraq. Um, it is central that uh, every religious minority be respected, have their opportunity to have their voice heard. And so, uh, yes, I think this is a priority. It's a priority for uh, the individuals affected, the religious minorities affected, it's a priority for the people of Iraq and certainly important uh, for American values as well. Thank you for that response, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I'm going to turn to the, uh, you just recently traveled to the Middle East. I want to turn to the question of Egypt and our relationship there. Um, the ranking mis member, Mr. Rogers, uh, rightfully pointed out the importance of this relationship and we're at the 40-year mark of a peace treaty that has held between Israel and Egypt. In 1979, I entered the Sinai Desert as a young man. And on this pile of twisted concrete and rubble, which sadly is so typical of seen now throughout the Middle East, were scrawled the words in spray paint, both in English and in Arabic. This had been the scene of the fighting in the 73 war. And it said, here was the war, here is the peace. That was a really important formative moment for me. This peace treaty, which at times has been cold, but has it come at great sacrifice for both the Egyptians and the Israelis, brokered by the United States, is a template, a model. So, Mr. Rogers, as well as your own, highlighting the importance of the relationship with Egypt, particularly in terms of the budget, 
to me is it a very essential priority because as we talk about potentially restoring Egypt's rightful place as a leader in the Arab world, without a strengthening of that relationship and quickly, I, I'm afraid we'll, we may miss a critical moment here, but there again is possibility. Thank you. I, I agree. If you saw on this trip to Middle East, I did not visit uh, Egypt. I did on the previous one where I gave some remarks in Cairo that talked about that very issue and language very similar to what you just described. Um, there are challenges in Egypt. There are human rights challenges in Egypt. We don't shy away from talking about those, but that is an important strategic relationship. It is, they are a linchpin of the Middle East, and they have been a good ally in the counterterrorism fight as well. Thank you. Ma Thank you. Ms. Frank. Good enough. Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Along the um, line of reasoning that um, Ranking Member Rogers just said, Mr. Secretary, uh, your agency and USAID, we give together, give about $25 billion a year in humanitarian assistance, poverty, anti-poverty programs, global health. How much does China give? It's a hypothetical. I don't, I don't mean to put you very, on the spot. A very, very small number. It so would, one of the largest it would be economies. A tiny fraction of this. Okay. So one of the largest economies of the world that has been progressing through our trade relations, through trade relations with the other, takes minimal or no responsibility for the world's development well-being. The point here is, I think the world is rapidly catching on that they're predatory lenders. Without, without taking full responsibility for the broader ideals of a development, of an ecosystem of development. And in that regard, I'm going to weave a little tail here. I, I want to follow up on Ms. Torres's comments. We spend, we're, we're trying, our, our immigration debate is, is one that is obviously complex and difficult, but part of the solution is to move it off the one yard line and to get back upstream into the countries where there is significant pressure either because of unrest, crime, or just economic need for people to leave. And so several years ago, we shifted a number of funds to the Northern Triangle to try to work constructively on system systems of justice and systematic economic reforms to create the conditions in which people can thrive there, which is a part of our broader immigration policy, and I, I, I agree with this. You mentioned the BUILD Act, though, tying back to the proper ecosystem for development. China runs around the world building large infrastructure projects with their own labor, uh, taxing the internal resources of uh, countries, particularly in Af Africa, uh, leaving large debt behind in those countries. Uh, we're running around the world trying to help people who are sick, trying to attack the structures of poverty, trying to create food security, and the types of micro-development assistance which lead to long-term stability and just government, uh, just economic outcomes and just governance. The BUILD Act is a, hopefully an attempt for us to recreate and reimagine what development assistance ought to be, because we've got our own problems, frankly, with fragmentation. So could it be one of the pathways, particularly in the Northern Triangle, in which we think about the ecosystem of development more creatively rather than just a large terminal or a large road and calling it development, but how we get underneath the structures of the deep wounds and structures of poverty and assist economically, but also assist with stability so that people can have flourishing uh, lives where they live. Uh, yes, I, I believe that uh, the model, the Build Act model... Is it a significant pathway for is, that kind it, of... Reform? It is significantly different than the way we've done before in multiple dimensions, not the least of which is uh, involves the private sector as well. It, it, we've watched other countries tie their government to their private sector in ways that we would never do, and we're proud that our, we have this separation in the United States. I'm not suggesting for a moment we should behave the way they do with their government state-owned enterprises. Um, but being connected, having understanding, having American values talked about explicitly in the way we engage in the world, I think is incredibly important. I think the Build Act is a very good model for well, that. Sometimes the market doesn't function properly. And right. It needs capital assistance from public sources to actually springboard into viable partnerships with the private sector who should be virtuously committed to, again, the long-term ecos ecosystem of proper economic well-being and development. And I think this is getting us there. I do see it as one pathway for reform of the fragmentation that we have. The ideal of, again, 
correcting market failure, but leveraging the best of the market and private outcomes so that there is continuity and sustainability of the initial aid. Sometimes we do the right thing by trying to build out a school, but when our soldiers or troops leave, it, it, it reverts back to what it was. It's not sustainable. So anyway, I'm sorry for the speech here, but I, I'm trying to immerse myself in this space. And I actually need to talk to you, Ms. Lowy, about this. We're, we want to convene a mapping strategy with key principles in this area, all the way from uh, the World Food Program to the World Bank to the uh, International Agricultural Fund and yeah, others. The IMF, others who are involved in, in these financing to, relationships. To try to rethink uh, whether or not we are overlapping, we're, we're too fragmented, and more creative, imaginative ways to approach a whole variety of poverty assistance programs worldwide. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Lee. 